is the last one. Let me move this along till we get to the beginning. And so when we, this is lesson 28, and we're calling it preparation and presentation. So as we go to this last one, this is sort of the introduction part. As we go to this last one, we're thinking about studying the Bible. We're thinking about putting it together and teaching it. And let me say this. When I say putting it together and teaching it, that doesn't mean you're going to stand up and maybe in a class like this or maybe in a, uh, behind the pulpit or maybe teaching a grow group or something. We're talking about that you could present truth and help other people. People understand it. And it may be a small group Bible study. It might be just a one-on-one thing. It could be in front of the whole church. It could be anything. But the goal is that we would know it. We'd be know how to put it together. And then we'd be able to present it to other people. And so as we look at this, as we think about 2 Timothy 2, 2, we have the responsibility, and you can just fill in as we go, to share the good news with others. That's evangelism. Share the good news. The goal is really make disciples. And so the first part, according to based on our Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2, we have the responsibility not only to share the good news with others, that's the, the salvation message, but also to be able to teach God's words to others. And, and that's discipleship. I think most believers would say that they feel like that they do have the responsibility to share their faith, although most believers don't share their faith. I mean, it's kind of a sad thing when if you ask every believer, do you think you should share your faith? And they all go, yeah. How often do you share that? Very very rarely. And then what about, do you think you should teach God's word? Most people say, oh, I don't think so. They really are. And how often do we do that as well? So th- there's a lot there. I want us to think about 2 Timothy 2.15. If you have your Bibles, turn, turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. I want us to take just a second to look at this verse. And, and just see what he says about studying the Bible, putting it together, and all of those things. While you're turning there, my Bible says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, what he actually says, be diligent. I, I put the, the, the word there. It means diligent means to study or to dig it to, to, as digging for treasure. The, one, some translations actually say study to show yourself approved. This says be diligent to present yourself approved to God. The idea there, diligent, is to dig it, is to get down there. In fact, the idea of search it out uh, you, so you don't have to be ashamed. And when he says, uh, you know, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman need not be ashamed, he's basically saying, listen, you want to know the scripture. You want to know how it fits together. You want to be able to dig it. You want to put it together. And then he goes on to say, Handling accurately the Word of God. And then it's also translated rightly dividing. It means to cut straight. It means to handle accurately. It means to know how the Bible fits together. That is so important in our lives. It's one thing to say, I know some verses. It's another thing to say, I know some Bible stories. It's another thing to be able to say, I know how the Bible fits together. If we said, draw up in times, can you do that? Could we say, could you give the flow of the Old Testament? Could you go back and start with Genesis 3 and show the, 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 the flow of the Messiah from Genesis 3 to Genesis 12 to 2 Samuel on there? Could you do that? We want to be able to rightly divide the Word of God. What well, if a person came to you and said, why is it, in the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices, but in the New Testament, you don't offer sacrifices. Would you be able to answer that and say, well, in the Old Testament, st- they were under Mosaic law, and Mosaic law said that when you sinned, they were waste to cover. But in the New Testament, Jesus already died and paid for all sin. He's the final sacrifice for sin. So in the New Testament, we're not under Mosaic law. And, and so you've got to be able to understand that and be able to defend those things. He said he saw somebody put something out on Facebook about some end-time thing, and they asked the question, is this a post-trib or a pre-trib and he answered it because he said I know that I mean I know how it fits together and so that's that's pretty neat that we we can do that so be diligent and cutting straight handling accurately the word of God so that's kind of the key thing now as we as we start looking at this there's going to be two big areas tonight one is preparation which is the study of the Bible and then presentation which is the teaching of the Bible I want to show you something there's a slide that's going to come up in a second that that's weird and we'll just pass right through it because I know the person who put these together was trying to show something, but it it doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, so here's something I want to show you. Let's think about this. What if there was a guy, and he was an evangelist, and he went, uh, every night he went someplace and presented the gospel, and a thousand people trusted Christ every night. We'd say, that is unbelievable. But now, but he leaves And goes, and the next night is another thousand. And the next night's another thousand. The next night, you know, there's another thousand. How many is that a year? 
365,000 people that have become believers. How many of these were trained? None, right? I mean, let's just say none. He, he leaves thousands of Christ and leaves. So what if there's me and you, and we spend a year together going through the 2-2, two -two, let's say. And at the end of a year, then I go and I have another guy, so that's us two. And then you go get another person, and that's two. And so that's one year, here's two years. And then at three years, then I go get another guy, he go get another guy. So now we've got four here and, you know, eight. And then that's th three years. And then four years. Do you realize that in 20 years, even though this is 365,000 a year, in 20 years, there's more of us than them. There would be all these people who have never been trained. They've all been evangelized but never trained. These have not only been evangelized but trained for a whole year. So what's the goal? Is the goal addition or is the goal multiplication? And so that's the key. That's why, it's, why Paul says to Timothy, take what you've been taught and entrust it to faithful people. It's not just share your faith, because if you share your faith with two people, then they just go on. But if you share your faith with two people, and you train them both, and then a year later, those are training people, suddenly it's gone from two to four to eight to 16 to 30. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why the Bible really talks about multiplication. Discipleship should be multiplication, not addition. And so as we think about studying the Bible and teaching the Bible and presenting all that, that's what we want to do. This chart right there, I'm not sure what that is. But anyway, so let's, let's move on as we, as we think about it. And it says we want to teach the Word of God. And, and as we look at it, we want to teach the Bible. Not stories, not information about the Bible. Had, I, I told you I taught some young people this morning at about 7, and we were talking about what to look for in a church. And I said, listen, there, see, we want to what? Teach the Bible. I said there, there are three types of what I call three types of pastors. There's those who talk, who talk well. Some of them are so good at talking that they draw large crowds. I mean, they, they're witty, they're funny, they're good but they don't teach anything. They just talk. And people go, that was wonderful. I said, what did he say? Oh, well, I don't know, but it was good. It was funny. Okay. Then there's people who actually talk about the Bible. Okay. And they're, they're okay because what they normally do is read a couple of verses and they talk about it and they give a story to go and they talk about the Bible. And then there's the third group is those who teach the Bible. The Bible says teach the word. Preach the word, which is the word to communicate the word. The idea is to take the truths and present them and help people understand them. So I think that the role is that we want to teach what? The word of God. We don't want to just talk about the Bible. We don't want to just talk. We want to teach the word of God. And so that's, that's the key thing that we want to do. Here's what Charles Ryrie said. He said, the Bible is the greatest of all books. To study it is the noblest of all pursuits and to understand it is the highest of all goals. Now think about that. He said, to study it is noble, to know it, uh, to, uh, uh, let's see, to, to, it's the greatest of all books, to study it is noble, to uh, pursue it and to understand it is the highest of all goals. Think about that. Wow. To know the scripture. I, I, I look back at my life and, I, and, you know, I can still remember when, uh, when I was with Knapp on a football trip, I took him on a football trip. I was coaching at Mississippi State. I took him to Auburn. We were playing Auburn on a away game, of course. And, and he, I had him as my roommate. And I didn't know. I said, Knapp, I don't understand. Um, why is this like Corinthians? And why is this like Peter? And why is this Romans? Why are these names of these books of the Bible? And he said, let's look at a map. And he showed me the map. And he said, see where it says Corinth? I went, yeah, Corinth. He said, this letter's to the Corinthians. I went, whoa. And I said, he said, see Rome? That's to the Romans. I went, what are you talking about? Is that, so that's how it fits. Yet for you guys, you grew up with this. I didn't grow up with any of this. And so I now, since I now know a, a, some of the Bible, I mean, what a privilege it is to get to know the Bible, to be taught the Scripture, to be able to understand it, and to be able to say, I, I now have an understanding of how it fits. And uh, that's what we want to do. We want to we teach the Bible. We want to be able to, to do all that. And so why, why is the Bible so important? Well, Hebrews 4.12, uh, you can just write this down if you want to, or you don't have to. It's the, the, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharpening to, to a disorder. It pierces for the Word, goes right to our hearts. We can study the Bible, and sometimes we go, oh, my. And, and you go, wow, 
That is amazing. And sometimes you just say, I've never seen this before. Sometimes you say, I know that it's showing me something that I should be doing or I should not be doing. I mean, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharpening two edges of gourd. So when it pierces as far as the vision of the soul and the spirits, the joints of the marrow, it goes right to the heart of the issue. Isaiah 55, 11 says it never comes back void. This is why I can stand up on a Sunday morning and we can teach 1 Samuel and somebody could say, you're telling me all those people out there need 1 Samuel? Yeah. Yeah, because what God will do is take his word. It will never come back void. It will touch people exactly how God wants them to touch. If some people may say, I never knew that about David. Somebody may say, I've never saw that about Saul. Somebody else may say, well, I don't even like those Philistines. I mean, so it's just ever how God wants to touch lives. The Bible never comes back void. It always accomplishes God's purpose. That's why the Bible is the key. You can be the wittiest, smartest, sharpest, funniest, laughter. You can just help people rolling in the flesh. If you're not teaching the Bible, you're wasting time. You know, you are. If, if we're talking about when you gather for this. The, Ezra 7.10, if you remember, we've studied this so many times. But Ezra said he was going to do three things. He was going to study the Word of God. He was going to apply the truth to, to, to his life, to our life. And he was to teach the Word to other people. That's what he wanted to do. So from Ezra, we're supposed to do what? Study the Bible apply it, and pass it on. That's basically 2 Timothy. Take what you've been taught, that's studying, and then live it out, and then pass it on to somebody else. So that is really the key of what this whole thing is about. And so I think that when we start talking in just a second about getting into the Scripture, sometimes it's a little tedious. I remember I taught a study one time, and I taught, it was like a group of about 14 women. We were all in a room, and they wanted me to teach them something. And I taught them how to study the Bible, and I taught them about them observe, observation, interpretation, application, you know, who, what, where, when, why. And that, that card, that, that note uh, thing I have back there for you, it has all that on this. I mean, it has it all on there. How, how you study the Bible. I taught them all this, and one lady at the end said, I'm not going to do all that. This is too much time. It takes too much work. Okay, well, if you want to know the Bible, you're going to have to do it. I mean, it gets tedious sometimes to talk about it. But if you're going to get in the Scripture, you're going to have to look at a passage and figure out how it fits together, those kind of things. So let's look at, uh, that begins with the Bible, of course, and, and you can use other books and other references. Um, we'll, get, we'll get to that in just a second. I've got, I've got some books I want to show you. Well, let me just show, I can just show you now. This is a book by Prof. Hendricks. It's called Teaching to Change Lives. It's, it's one of my favorite books. He, of course, passed away. But this book is, helps you, like you read this, and it helps you get encouraged about how you can take what you know and pass it on to others. And it's not written to a person to be like a pastor or necessarily stand up like this. It's to be able to say, study it and help me pass it on. There's another book. And this is by the, the new, profe the new uh, uh, president of Dallas Seminary is Mark Yarber. He's really a good guy. And this book has the worst title. In fact, I, I, I think he should change the title because here's the title. How to read the Bible like a seminary professor. Who wants to read the Bible like a seminary professor? Nobody. I mean, but this book actually is how to study the Bible and how to put it together. And it is outstanding. So he needs to change the title. Because it's, I mean, if most people look at this and they go, I'm not interested in that book. I don't want to read the Bible like a seminary professor. Right? Right? Would you? Do you want to read this when you first hear it? Now, teaching to change lives, what do you think about that one? Yeah, okay. But anyway, they're both outstanding, okay? And uh, so if, if you talk to me afterwards, I can, I can order some of these. I can get some. I, we have some in, we, know, we have some of these. So we can do that for you. Those are really, really, really good books. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about the basics of Bible study, okay? These are basic things that we all know, and we're going to go through them and talk about them. First of all, we, 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 call, we call ours historical, literal, grammatical interpretation. That's what we call it. And so when people say, do you study the Bible literally? We say, well, it's really more of historical, literal, grammatical interpretation. It is literal in that sense. So historical means that it, what, what is the context of the book or the passage? How does it fit? If you're studying First Samuel with us on Sunday morning, 
You don't just say, for Samuel, you say, when did that happen? I mean, when did Samuel live? When did Saul live? When did David live? Who are the Philistines? What are these people, the Moabites, the Amalekites? How does this fit? How does it fit in history? When, what, when did this happen? Was this 2,000 years before Christ? Was it 1,000 years before? How did it fit in there? So whenever you look at a passage of the Bible, you don't just say Second Timothy. When did Paul write Second Timothy? I mean, first of all, you got to know Paul wrote it to Timothy. When did he do it? Where was he? So that's the historical aspect. The literal means what do the words literally mean? Not what others tell you they mean. And when it says he will rule for a thousand years, what do you think that means? He will rule for a thousand years. That's what we call a literal interpretation. The words mean what they mean. When it says rightly dividing the word of God, rightly dividing means to cut it straight. It means to divide it right. We know what those mean, literally what those words mean. When Jesus says, when Jesus got in the boat or when he put dirt on a guy's eye and he could see or when he said this or when Elijah said this, it's, we take it literally. We see what does the Bible say. And then the last thing is grammatically. This is a little bit harder, but this is where you have to say, What's the subject? What's the verb? Let me ask you this. If, if the sentence actually says, the man kicked the ball, the sentence can't say the ball kicked the man, can it? You can't. And see, some people do that in the languages. Some people do that in the Bible. I was at a church one time when I was in seminary, and I was just visiting the church, and the guy that was teaching the class was doing the Gospel of Mark, and he got to a verse, and he actually said the verse said the opposite of what it said. He taught it as the opposite of what it said because he didn't look at it carefully. He thought it said something, and he just started teaching it. And, you know, some people looked around and caught it. Most people didn't even care. They didn't know. So you've got to look at what does it actually say? What's the subject of the sentence? You know, you've heard me say this over and over, but that verse that says, For by grace you have been saved. Okay, you can't, you don't, you, you can't say by grace you will be saved. You can't say by grace you are saved. Because that's not what the verse says. It actually says you have been saved. It's a past tense verb in the Greek that says a continuing result. He's actually saying by grace you've been saved and you're going to always be saved. And so it makes a difference. And so when we study the Bible, we study it historically, literally, and grammatically. The second thing is we always study the passage in its context. That's number two. And you've got to look at the context. You've got to follow the flow. And, uh, and, and there are times people, I've, as people say, I don't understand this. I said, well, just keep reading. And they read and they go, oh, oh, it says it right here. You know, I, I remember a person was, uh, was reading uh, Revelation chapter 1 and, and, and Jesus is, he sees Jesus or he sees Jesus and these lampstands are around. And the person said, I don't know what these lampstands are. I said, well, just keep reading. Because the end of the passage says the lampstands are the seven churches. <laughs> you know, so I said, now do you know who the lampstand is? If you just kind of look at the context of the passage, always see the context of the passage. And, uh, and, and, and then third it, uh, examples, uh, Matthew eighteen twenty, where two or three are what? If you're gathered in my name, I'm with you. So by the way, if you're by yourself, he's not with you? I thought he said he'd never leave us or forsake us. So he's always with us. That verse can't mean if you get two or three people together. If you look at the context, what's the context? It's church discipline. It's removing somebody from the body. Colossians 3, 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I've had people say, yeah, if you've got a decision to make, you better have peace about it. That passage is dealing with get along with fellow believers. It has nothing to do with decision making. So always look at the context of the passage. And the last one is interpret Scripture with Scripture. And that's, what, uh, that's where you have the cross references. That's where you, when it says the seven lampstands, if you keep reading, if you keep looking around, you're going to find that he gives you some of the answers. And so there's, there's some great stuff there. So always study that. We use references. Oh, let me go back for just a second. Uh, so use references, use other verses, use things. It's, it's okay to have one of those Bibles that have a lot of cross-references. Just be careful. Sometimes all they're cross-referencing is a word. And sometimes the word cross reference to another word doesn't mean it's the same context. It just means this word was used here and this word was used here. So be careful when you study those kind of things. So let's talk about ways we can study and teach the Bible. Okay? And this, this is important. And uh, so let's look at it. Here's the first way. The first way is what we call a topical study. How, how many of y'all heard of a topical study, right? Uh, let's teach you about the love of God. Let's teach, uh, let's teach forgiveness. Let's teach something, something, okay? Well, let me just say this. A topical study is 
uh, well, let me give you all three. The, there's a topical study, then uh, teach a passage of Scripture, and then actually teach a book of the Bible. So I think we did those three, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. And then we, okay, so that's the big three. Topical study, passage of Scripture, book of the Bible. Now, let's talk about a topical study for just a second. A topical study, first of all, you, you come up with a topic. And by the way, this is the hardest way to teach. Now, most people think, no, this is the easiest way to teach. What do you want to do? I want to teach about forgiveness. Okay, I want to teach about the love of God. You do? Do you realize how much the Bible talks about the love of God and you're going to teach that? I mean, just you got to be careful. But when you pick a, a subject, it's really one of the hardest things to do because you've got, you've got to ask all kind of questions about the topic, whether you're going to study angels. You know, we did a study on angels and demons, right? And it wasn't something you could do in, in two nights. We, we went for 14 weeks and didn't even exhaust the study. And we, we looked at every kind of thing you, you could do. And, and, and so you ask things about the topic, right? Who is the, what's it talking about? Where, when, how? All of those kind of things. And, and so it's probably one of the hardest things. And let's, let's say we, we were, we, let me get one more. I think there's one more. We must, here's the thing. Think about this. If you said, I want to study the love of God, or if you wanted to study forgiveness, you're going to have to look up almost every verse in its context to make sure you don't just pull a verse out. I, I was with a Bible study, went in a Bible study with a guy one time, and he was talking about, I, I don't, I think, let's just say forgiveness. So he started off by saying, we want to talk about forgiveness tonight. Turn to this verse. And so he turned to the verse, and he read the verse, and he said, God says forgive. Then he said, turn to, and we went to like nine or ten verses in a row, and all he did was read the verses and say we should forgive. Well, that's not teaching forgiveness. I mean, that's just going to verses, so you've got to be really careful that you just go to, to, to verses. Um, let's say forgiveness. What would you do if you said, if somebody said to you, would you do a study on forgiveness? You could say, golly, that's a deep, I mean, that's a big subject because it's everywhere. So what is forgiveness? What does the Greek word forgiveness mean? What does the Hebrew word forgiveness mean? What does the command be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just in God, God, God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us? What are the reasons we forgive? What are the results of not forgiving? If God forgives us, why should we forgive others? How do we forgive ourselves? I mean, these are all kind of things you think about when you're going to study something. You don't just say, let me look up 10 verses about forgiveness and try to teach it. So what I'm saying is, if you said, I want to teach a Bible study, whatever subject you decide to teach, you're going to have to really do a lot of digging to put it together. And then, I mean, because I mean, I do those kinds of things all the time. And we're doing the life of Elijah. That's a little bit different. We've done the life of Elisha, the life of Elijah. We've done forgiveness. We've done rewards. We've done all those things. Uh, even in even even each one of these lessons is almost a topical study in itself. And so it, you, it's not as you can tell, they're pretty deep. It's not like I just picked three or four verses and said this is what this is about. So I think studying you know, is, is, a, is a hard way to do it. Okay, the second way is using a passage from the Bible. And, and this is, I think, the easiest way to teach because you're going to the Scripture, you're taking a passage, you're looking at it in its context, and you're going to teach it. That's the plan. And how do you, how do, you do it? Well, you, uh, let, me, let me show you something. You read the passage over and over, also to see the passage and to get the context. And I'm going to give you some. Pa I'm going to give you some passages for you for fun, not tonight, but for you for fun to say. What if I wanted to study this on my own by myself? How would I do putting this together? So you read the passages over and over. You study it in its context of the book, of the book. If you did Second Timothy two one through something, you can't just pull that out. You have to see how does it fit in the book. And the third thing is you use the Bible study methods, observation, interpretation, application. That's on the back of that card. It tells you how to look at a passage, what questions to ask, and what to look for. Let me give you some verses just to write down, okay? There are four places that I think you would have fun to go by yourself and dig it. Here's one. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. That's the number one passage in the Bible on reconciliation, Okay? Here's another one. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. You know what that says? We were surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily entangle us and run with endurance the race set before us 
fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's only two verses, but it's huge. And how about Romans 12, 1 and 2? I beseech you, brother, by the mercy of God to do what? Present your bodies. And then he actually tells you how to do it. Stop being conformed to the world, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then one other good one is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Those are four places that I, if, if, if you said, I, I want to practice myself actually getting into a passage of Scripture and trying to study it on my own, you could pick out any one of those, and you would be surprised. I told you all the first time I ever decided to study the Bible on my own, uh, you know, I had this idea that you should study a book of the Bible. So I thought, okay, I'm going to study a book, a book of the Bible. And I picked Philemon because it only had 25 verses. I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm not going to get bogged down. And I, I never realized how deep that book is and what's in that book. That book has the doctrine of imputation in it. Remember, imputation is with the credit from one account to another. Paul tells the Philemon that if Onesimus has done wrong, put it on his account, and he will pay it. That's imputation. When you study books of the Bible, you go, oh, my gracious, I didn't even realize that was in there. So read the passage, study it in this context, use the Bible study method. And, and so you have all these good, good things, and they're all kind of books. And then here's the fourth thing that you do. Then you can go to the resources. Let me tell you something not to do. Don't get a passage, say, okay, I'm going to do Romans 12, 1 and 2. So you sit down and you read Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then you pick up a commentary, and it says Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then he starts off and you write all this down. And th Don't do that because everything you see from that point on will be what you've already read. You do your own work yourself by yourself. Don't look at other things. Uh, if, you've got, if, you, if you've got some resources that will help you see what Greek and Hebrew words are, that if you can, that's fine. But don't go read somebody's commentary let me just say this. Let's just make this up. Let's say you want to do Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Well, you might have the commentary that I did, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the grace. Don't go look at what I said in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 until you studied it yourself. Because you may say, boy, J.B. missed that one, didn't he? Boy, he didn't know what he's doing there. I mean, it's true. So you want to study it yourself and then go to the resources. The third way is, is uh, uh, when you do actually book studies. Now, this is, you go verse by verse, passage by passage. Does that sound familiar? That's what we do all the time. We do it on Sunday mornings. We do it at different other places. And, and it's the same method as number two, except you can't just on Sunday morning stand up and say, turn to first... Uh, Samuel chapter 14. Okay, let's look at verse 1. Well, Paul said, you know, or Peter said this, or John said this, or said, you can't do that. You have to say, okay, as we look at this passage this morning, remember where we are in the book. We've seen this. Saul has become king. You, when you're teaching verse by verse, passage by passage, you have to continually help people see where you are especially if it's a Bible study or something, because some people might not have been there. Some people forget everything. Listen, if I said to you right now, what did we teach last Sunday? Most of you would probably say, I, it was good, but I don't remember it, right? I mean, we just don't remember things. In fact, I'm trying to remember, was it chapter 14? I don't remember what chapter it was. I mean, I don't remember it. So, so that's why you have to help people review and put it together. Okay, so it, it's some great stuff. So any questions about any of this? Let's see, what else do I have? Okay, let me go back. Just to, any questions about how do you study? I mean, and, and we're going to get into more detail in just a second. But you, you, you're either going to study a topic, you're either going to study a passage, you're going to study a book. And it, it, the easiest way, I think, is a passage or a book. Topics are great, but it just, it, it, to do them right, you've got to do a lot of work. And you may not have the time to, to go through and look up forgiveness throughout every place forgiveness is mentioned in the Bible if you were going to do forgiveness. You know, so things like that. Uh, any questions or anything on this? Okay, let's talk about presentation. Let's talk about now you've studied it, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, after we studied God's Word, we then are to do what? Pass the truths on to other people. So you can fill in the blanks. This is a little further down, I think, and this is presentation. See, our goal is to what? Take what we've been taught and do what? What is 2 Timothy 2.2? 2, 2? This whole study is called, what is this study called? The 2.2, 2, right? 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The whole goal is to take what we've been taught and do what? 
pass it on to somebody else. Treat, teach others, faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. That's the goal. So after we've studied the Word of God, we are to pass it on to other people. That is our goal. And what we want to do is this. We want to present God's Word, what, clearly, accurately, and in a way that is interesting to those who hear. That last part is important. You don't have to be funny and clever all the time. You can be, but, but don't do this. Um, turn to um, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going we're gonna to look at a verse, I think, tonight that I think you're going to enjoy it a lot, and uh, it has a lot in there. And so Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and so turn, turn to Ephesians. Is that how you, what you want, or do you want somebody to go, okay, let's turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 2, because what we're going to do is we're going to see three things that Paul teaches in Ephesians 2. I think you're going to love it, right? There's a difference. You, you don't want to, Prof. Hendricks used to say, don't bore people with the Bible. You know, so you want to, not only is it to be clear, and accurate, but it is a way that is interesting to those who hear. So just remember that when you present it. That, that's, that's kind of the goal that you're trying to do. So let me give you, uh, th- this, is, this is some really fun stuff. And so here's what we're going to see. Three big aspects. Are you ready? Three big aspects. First, we're going to see what we call the final preparation. Okay? Then we're going to see the basics of a message. And we're going to see some tips in delivery. Okay? So I'm just going to give you some things that I've learned over the years and things like that. Uh, the first time I ever taught, I can still remember that Knapp said, I want you to teach this class. This is a class. I had taught one other time, but and, and I still remember that night had a little thing like this, and I stood in front of the people, and I went, well, I'm so glad you're all here. You know, I was so scared. I was so scared. I didn't know what to do. I mean, but, but you know, as years go by, you, you get more comfortable. And people say, do you ever get nervous up there? I go, No. And they said, what if, what if it was like a lot of people? I said, I'd rather it be 10,000 people than two people. The, it doesn't matter how many is there. You're going you're gonna to teach the truth, and if you're teaching the truth, you'd rather have 10,000 people here than two people. I mean, you know what I'm just saying? So numbers, that, I mean, I've talked to people, and they've said, I came up, on the, up to the platform to give an announcement or something, and I looked out there, and, you know, your heart just stops beating there for a second because you're not used to seeing all those people looking at you. Uh, you know, it doesn't bother me now. Uh, it used to, but before I started really growing as a Christian and studying and all that, it did. But now with, I think with the gift of teaching, I, I can hardly wait to do that. Let's talk about, let's talk about final preparation, okay? Final preparation. We want to be clear and accurate. And that, that's a key. You want to be clear and accurate. We've studied the Bible. We've put it together. We want to be able to communicate the truths, we, whether we're given a devotional, a one-time message, teaching a topical study, going through a book. It doesn't matter. We want to be very, very clear. And so we ask ourselves these questions, okay? What is the main point? What are you trying to teach? Now, sometimes... There may be more than just one thing. I mean, you know, we, 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 we can see several things, but what's the main idea? Or what is the idea? You know that, that the Bible is divided into paragraphs. I don't know if you realize that, right? Most of your Bibles actually show paragraphs. And most, of, like if you have a New American Standard or a Bible like mine, the real dark numbers is the beginning of another paragraph. So I don't know if you realize that. And usually a paragraph has a main idea. So if you study some verses, sometimes they're just one paragraph with a main idea. So what is the main idea? What is Paul saying? And when Paul talks about being reconciled, the, what's the subject of that little section? Being reconciled. I mean, so you look at it. So what's the main point? What do you want them to apply and understand? What do you want them to know? What do you want them to understand? What do you want them to live out based on this passage? That's What are you trying to do with it? Because you're not just teaching to teach it. You're teaching it to them to understand it and apply it. And the third thing is, what illustrations or what things can you say that can help them understand it? Illustrations are fine. I use mostly biblical illustrations. I don't usually use a lot of illustrations outside of the Bible, but I'll say something like this, and I'll say, you know, as we say, it's all the same thing when Jesus taught something like this. And so we see that kind of thing. So what illustrations uh, can you do? So this is the final preparation, and, and so powerful. Now, with that in mind, let's go to the message, and I'm going to give you uh, three, the basics of a message. I want to give you uh, three simple truths. Are you ready? If you do this, whenever you speak, it'll always be communicated well. If you'll do one thing, here's what you do. You get up and you 
tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. Now, there used to be a, a girl that went to our church this is years ago when she was a professor at OSU and she taught English and she taught English literature and she taught speech. And she made, I'm, I'm just telling you what she did, she made her class come to our church once a semester to watch me teach because I always get up and say, here's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look three things from Paul. Then I would tell you the three things from Paul. And at the end, I'd say, and this morning we've seen the three things from Paul. And she would say to them, this, you watch, because this is how you give a message. You tell people what you're going to tell them. You tell them what you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. How many times have you, somebody started talking, and you have no idea what they're talking about? You go, what are they talking about? What, what are they talking about? So the basics of the message are the Seed Simple Truths is the introduction, okay? The introduction is you tell them, what, and if you move down now to where it says the details, the introduction, you tell them uh, what you're going to tell them. You tell them that. You tell them this is this is what you're going to study. You give. You tell them the passage. You teach. You illustrate. You. You. Then you give the summary. So in the introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them. Um, this morning, this evening, we're going to look at Acts chapter one, verse eight. We're not only going to look at one verse, but as we look at this verse, we're going to see that Jesus gives his final message to his disciples. They're on the Mount of Olives, and this is his final message. And what we're going to see as we study this passage, we're going to see what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and where we're supposed to do it. So get ready as we look at Acts 1. What did I just tell you? I told you exactly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Jesus' final message on the Mount of Olives to the disciples, and we're going to see three things. What we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and where we're supposed to do it. And that's Acts chapter 1. And, and then you could have, as you do this, you could have, uh, well, that's the message and that's the, the summary. So in the introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them. And you want to capture their attention. If you just said, turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and we're going to look at a verse this morning. Okay, somebody read it. Okay, that's nothing. What, well, I don't even know what we're talking about. But if I said, turn in your Bibles to Acts 1, 8, because we're going to look at something great. Jesus' last words. What did he tell his men right before he ascended into heaven. Because in this end of this passage, he's gone. What did he tell them? We're going to see three things. We're going to see what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and where we're supposed to do it. So let's turn it in. So let's look. See? And see, there's a difference. You're, you've communicated and you've captured attention. You've, you've got an illustration. And, and maybe, maybe you start off by saying, if you were going to die and you knew you were dying and your family was around your bed, what would you want to tell them? What would be your last words? And then you say, Jesus is leaving. This is his last words to his guys. What's he going to tell them? That's an illustration that starts it off. So you want to get their attention. You want to, you want to, you want to do that. And, and so that, that's how it fits together. So with that, you, you, you tell them. Words are important. Words are important. I'm not great with words. I mean, I, there are people who are just so much more creative than me. I, I just use old basic stuff because I'm not very smart. And I just say, well, I just said fall down. I didn't know what else to say, you know. So anyway, let them think. Let people think about it. What if I said, what would you, what would be your last words? And you don't just start talking. You let people think for a second. What would be my last words? What would I want to tell Catherine and Sarah and Karsten and Riley and Oh, and what would I want to tell them if I was dying and I knew that was it? That, uh, what would you tell them? What did Jesus say? Because he's been with these guys for three and a half years, and they love him. And he's told them all this, and he died, and he rose again, and he's walked on the earth for 40 days, and he's taught them for 40 days. But what's his last words going to be? So introduction is you capture their attention. You tell them what, what? You tell them what you're going to tell them, okay? Then you teach them. You tell them. You tell them, and you make the points clear, and, 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 and you, what is Acts 1 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And so you talk about the word power. What, what is it? it says you shall receive power. Well, that's the Greek word dunamis, which means ability. He says you're going to get ability when the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? And you start teaching about that when he comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. What is a witness? 
That's the person who tells the truth. That's the person who tells what they know. And you, you might even you might even then go over to Second Corinthians five twenty and say we're witnesses. They're witnesses. We're ambassadors for Christ. We get to tell people about Christ. So you tell them the message and you tell them what's going on and you give some illustrations and you you put the passage together for them and they go wow and and you teach them through the passage. I, I do a thing with the farmhouse guys every year. Uh, it, it's always their freshman. It's their pledge class, so they come in, so they, this is their first time they, you know, usually been with me, but I always take John, I teach him John chapter 3 every time, and I teach the, the Nicodemus coming to Jesus, and I teach through the passage, I tell him well, who's a Pharisee, what's this, a lot of them know the Bible, they know it enough, and we put that passage together, so you, you want to teach people what that passage says, and then, and tell them, tell them the truth, and make it clear. You know, if it says something that's hard, you still have to say something that's hard. Use illustrations to help and vis- visualize and, and relate the passage. And stick with your main points. Keep teaching through what you're trying to do. And you could even say, so what did he tell us? He said, you shall receive power. That's how you do it. You shall be my witnesses. That's what you're supposed to do. And you'll start where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other parts of the world. So we said, he's going to tell us what we do. We're witnesses. He tells us how to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He tells us where we're going to do it, beginning in them, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. For us, it's somewhere else. So you get to the, the, you you may raise questions. I've taught on Sunday morning and asked questions. You know, I'll say, and, and if you believe, you get what? And then all about it goes, eternal life, something like that. The summary, the application is tell them what you just told them. So you start off, here's what we're going to talk about. Then you tell them what you're going to talk about. And you get to the end and you say, now here's what we've talked about. Here's what we've seen. Tell them what you told them. Bring together the summary of the main points. You'd say something like, Jesus gives his final word to his witnesses. He tells them that they're going to get power. And, and, and beginning right where they are, they're going to tell the message of Jesus Christ. So what would be the applications? Well, first of all, we witness in what power? Power of the Holy Spirit. Who, what's our message we tell about Jesus' death and resurrection? Where do we tell this message? You start where the people are the closest to you, and then you spread it out. That's applications for us, okay? So that's just a way to teach. And, and if you'll just remember this, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. It'll change everything because you will have to say to yourself, okay, what am I going to tell them? And then you tell them, and then you say, what did I tell them? <laughs> Make sure you told them the right thing. Okay, we take taking what you study and turning it into a message to communicate with others. It's a hard part. It's about the hardest part because you've studied it. You've put it together. You said, man, I understand Acts 1-8. Okay, how are you going to communicate those truths to somebody else? So with that in mind, let's talk about some tips and things about the teaching the Bible and all those kind of things. Okay, so I've got tips and delivery. Here's number one. Be excited. Be excited. Remember, don't go... Turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. This should be really fun. <laughs> right? <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4 because we're going to see three things from this passage tonight that will help us as we seek to stand for Christ. There are three things here that I think will encourage us. Okay, you, you want to look at that, right? You say, oh, what are those three things? I want to know. I want to be excited. You know why you should be excited? You are teaching God's Word, and it will change lives forever. That's why you should be excited. This is the Word of God. It's alive and powerful and sharp into His sword. never comes back void, accomplishes the purposes. Just remember that. So uh, this is what John Maxwell said. I thought this was pretty neat. He writes and says, confidence and preparation, it brings energy and passion. He says, the more energy you bring to the process, the better you are at conveying it to your audience. He just basically, he's a, he's a speaker. He's not necessarily a Bible teacher. But he talks about if you, if you don't come with passion and excitement and, 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 and being saying, man, I love this. I can hardly wait to teach this. People come to me and they say, how many times have you taught the 2-2? I go, I have no idea. I mean, we've been doing it over 20 years, maybe longer than 20 years. Uh, well, I know it's longer than 20 years because some of that's copyrighted 1998, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, or, I mean that's 23 years right there. And, and, and somebody said, well, don't you get tired of teaching it? I said, I never get tired of teaching it. First of all, I never get tired of teaching. And second, I never get tired of teaching this stuff. This is so 
good. It's so fun. It's just so amazing. So be excited because you're getting to teach the Bible, and the Bible changes people's lives. That's what it is. And remember, God's Word is profitable. If you want to write that down, God's Word, A, it's profitable. All Scripture is inspired by God and is what? Profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, mature, equipped for every good work. Listen, the Bible is the key. I was teaching those young people this morning, and I said, what's our foundation for everything? And they went, Jesus. I said, how do you know about Jesus? And they went, Bible. I said, yeah, what's the foundation? And they went, the Bible. It is. It is. I mean, we, we, we love Jesus, and he's the greatest. He's our Savior. He's everything. But how do you know anything about Jesus? And how do you know what Jesus wants you to do? How do you find it? Where do you find it? The Bible. Exactly. The word's profitable. It's powerful. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, alive and powerful and sharpening a two-edged sword. And the third thing is it's purposeful. It never comes back void. Listen, if you're a teacher and you can go with the confidence that when you give people the Bible, it will never come back void. It will accomplish the purpose that God has for it. That You don't have to say, I hope that's going to be good. Look, it's not a question of whether you're good or not. It's not about you. It's not about the teacher. It's about the message and the, and, the, and the information that you're giving out. And you give it out with passion and love and, and excitement. But it's not about you. And, and that's why it's real easy when you get through teaching and say, was that any good? Well, it's not about you. It really isn't. And sometimes people will come up and they'll say, that was good. I go, grace of God. And it is. It's the grace of God. Grace of God, you get to teach. Grace of God is the word of God. The grace of God that is not the communicator that makes the difference. It's the message that makes the difference. So God's word. The second thing is be confident. When you're teaching, be confident. You know why? Because you're the one that studied it. <laughs> you're the one that knows it. You're the one that's dug the passage. You're the one that knows how it fits together. And so you should be confident when you're teaching. And let me tell you, if you're not confident, then apparently you haven't studied enough yet. Right? You haven't, you haven't got it where you think, I think I have a good understanding of what this says. Now, it's okay, to, you know, it, 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 I'll show you in just the, the next one down. But, but it, you know, teach with confidence. Remember, the authority is the Word of God. You're not the authority. You're just saying what Scripture says. You're just teaching the Word of God. So you, you should be confident because you've looked at the passage. You put it all together. If somebody said, what's Acts 1-8 about you? Say, I know what it's about. It's got three things in there that we really need to know. And I know what the word power means because I studied it. I know what the word witness means because I studied it. I, I know wh where Judea is and, and Samaria. I know why he said that. I know, uh, you know, and you've studied it, so you feel confident about that. The, uh, the other thing is don't be afraid to say, I don't know. You can't know everything. There's no way to know everything. You know, don't be afraid. You, you can't know it all. And, I mean, I've studied, I've been, I mean, I've been a pastor almost 40 years, and I've studied the Bible even before I got to, to be a pastor. And so I've studied it, and if you said, have you studied 2 Timothy? Yeah. Have you studied Romans? Yeah. I mean, I've studied almost every book of the Bible. There's still stuff, a lot of stuff I don't know. You could say, how does that fit together? I go, I don't know. I don't know. And sometimes we say, there's no way to know because we don't have, he didn't give us enough information. But sometimes we just have to say, I don't know, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look it up. I'll see if I can find some things out. I can see if I can get some more information. Because sometimes they'll ask you a question, and you said, I don't know. I really I didn't think about that. I don't know. Let me, let me look it up. There was a, there's an old saying that was at Dallas Seminary that there were two professors. They were, you know, and the story was that if you went to one professor and he was talking and you asked a question that, that he might not know the answer, he'd go something like, well, actually, when you look at the Bible, and he'd just beat around the bush, and everybody could tell he didn't know. And then there was another professor who'd been there for years, and you'd say, Professor, what was it? And he'd go, you know, that question is, man, that is, that is so deep. I'm, just not, I'm not prepared to answer that. Let me, let me get some time to look it up, and I'll come back, and we'll talk about it. And everybody went, wow. You know, so if you don't know, don't say. Don't beat around the bush. Just say, I don't know. You could say something like, I used to know, but I forgot, and then so I'll, I'll now, you know. But you just don't know. It's okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. Ask that this is a key, especially if you've got a Bible study. Ask questions dealing with application, not interpretation. You are teaching them the Bible. You're not asking them to interpret it. What's your job? 
I'm teaching them the Bible so they can interpret it. You're not asking them. So, so if you're sitting there, I've, I've been to Bible studies, just been in them where somebody will say, uh, if somebody read Acts 1.8, okay, and they read it. Okay, what, what does this mean to us? You've just asked them to read a verse and then interpret it. They never even studied it. How do you do a Bible study? You observe it, you interpret it, you apply it. You've asked them to read it and give an interpretation without observing it or really interpreting it. And who's supposed to be the one teaching the class? You or them? You are. So don't ask questions dealing with interpretation. Ask questions dealing with application. And you say, when you see this about we will see power when the Holy Spirit's come upon us, what does that mean to us? How can we apply that? Well, we all know that the moment we believe, we get the Holy Spirit. So how, how does this uh, help us when we think about sharing our faith? And so ask questions dealing with application, not interpretation. But how many times have you been in a Bible study and they ask you to read a verse and tell it what it means? Uh, I think if, if you're ever in a Bible study and somebody says, uh, tell us what this means, you say, well, I hadn't the one studied it. You are. Why don't you tell us what it means? Aren't you the one that's supposed to have studied it? I mean, you just asked me to look at it. I didn't have time to study it. I mean, think about it. So then, and then, because uh, they didn't study it, you did. So don't ask interpretation questions. And ask, how can we apply this truth? And then the last thing is, and we're almost through, so just realize this, that different types of literature will affect how you teach. And when you say, what do you mean literature? Well, the Bible is different literature. The Bible is narrative. The Bible is, has poems. The Bible has songs. The Bible has epistles, which are like letters. I mean, so different types. Let me show you this. Narrative literature is easier to teach and more difficult to apply. Okay, David's going to fight Goliath, right? So David, you read the story. David picks up the stones. He's going to fight Goliath. Goliath's nine feet, nine inches tall. He puts on armor. It doesn't fit. He takes the stuff. He goes and kills Goliath. Okay, that's a great story. Everybody knows the story. What's the applications? You say, well, okay. It's just, it doesn't tell us any applications. I, I guess... Uh, Better have at least five stones if you're going to go after a giant. I don't know. I mean, what's the applications? Well, uh, you got to trust God because he kept saying the battle's the Lord. So no matter what's going on in our lives, trust God. So, I mean, you, you, you have to come up with an application from narrative literature. I mean, Jesus gets in the boat, goes across the Sea of Galilee, gets to the other side. What's the application? I don't know. Maybe there's not even one there. Now, they got in a storm in the middle. Uh, and, and, and they didn't trust God, and, and they woke Jesus up, and he said, okay, be still. The application is, he, look, he's, first of all, he's the creator of everything. You gotta trust him, and you don't have to be afraid in the midst of the storms of life. But so that's applications from a narrative, okay? But here's something else. The epistles and doctrinal, they're harder to teach, but easier to apply. Okay, we're Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is a hard passage to teach, but it says, stop letting sin run in your mortal body. What do you think the application is? Stop letting sin reign in your mortal body. I mean, he tells you the applications. So in, in epistles and doctrinal teaching, it's harder to teach the truths because it's not narrative. It's not stories. I mean, it's, it's easier to teach the life of Christ. It's easier to teach 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, because these are narratives. They're stories. It's easier to teach Elisha. I mean, we see Elisha going out and, you know, raising somebody from the dead and doing all this, and we say, oh, that's a good story. What's the application from that? You know? Uh, but in the epistles, when Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, what's the application here? To present your bodies as living sacrifices. There's the application for the passage. You have to teach through it and put it all together. So some great, great stuff. Great, I mean, it's, it's great. I, I love all this. Now, you may not love all this. I do. But I think that if you're going to communicate the truth, and the whole reason we take the 2-2 is not just to say I know more information. It is to take what you've been taught and do what? And in, in, invest this into other people and, and put this to other people who will to teach others as well. So here's the summary. We present God's word clearly, accurately, and interestingly. I don't even know how to say that word. So that they can know and apply truths and principles from God's word. So you have the greatest privilege and I have the greatest privilege. And that is to take the truths from the Word of God, which is alive and powerful. And this is not just some book. This is from the creator of the whole everything. He actually gave us information in written form. And he says, take this, know this, live it out, and pass it on. And that's what we're supposed to do.
And that's the summary. And that's some verses there. Things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the whole theme book. That's the theme of this whole study. And then be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Do what? Handling accurately the word of God, the word of truth.